1.4 billion people. No one on the streets, no customers in the shops. Where did everyone go? People filming the videos can't help but ask, what's the future for physical stores? The owner of Beijing Caihong Tea Shop angrily stated, quote, This year, whether you succeed or not isn't about how hard you work. Even if you work hard, you can't make money. Just look at these empty streets. Then you'll understand. Once bustling Wanda Plaza in Xiaogan, Hubei, now stands deserted, with many shops closed and few shoppers in sight. The same goes for the small, empty even at noon. How can the shops here survive? People lament that maybe it's better not to open stores in these years, just hold on to your money. The decline in foot traffic in mid to high-end shopping malls might be understandable, but it's surprising that even supermarkets are facing crises. There are hardly any people, even on weekends. I rarely come to the market, maybe around five times a year. I've noticed there are far fewer people shopping here now, perhaps because they are unwilling to spend money. She learned from supermarket staff that many items aren't selling, and items nearing expiration are discounted, like something originally priced at 25 yuan being discounted to 10 yuan. Supermarkets also set sales targets of thousands of yuan a day for staff, but they're difficult to meet. The woman filming the video commented on the tough situation faced by ordinary people and shop owners alike, attributing it mainly to the worsening consumer market crisis. Many physical stores are now facing significant challenges, especially in the restaurant industry. Look at the hot pot restaurants now. It's 7 in the evening, not a single table occupied. No one is eating hot pot. It's 8 o'clock now. Let's see if any of the stores have customers. There's no one here. Not at this hot pot place either. Nor at the dumpling and wonton shop. The economy doesn't look promising. There's hardly anyone even at 8 o'clock. This newly opened restaurant in Kunshan, Jiangsu, spent 400,000 yuan to take over the business but has had no customers. The owner lamented, stating that China's food industry seems to be entering a difficult period. A food street in Guangyuan, Sichuan, also sees few people. A shop owner there expressed hopelessness, saying, quote, paying over 20,000 yuan in rent, supporting 15 employees, life is too hard. A person from Zhengzhou, Henan, mentioned that with increasing unemployment and difficulties in finding new jobs, more and more young people are turning to street vending, with the number of stalls growing exponentially. For example, in her night market, there were only 20 to 30 stalls last year, but this year it has reached 60 to 70 stalls. Former customers have become stall holders. Despite the increase in the number of stalls, there is a noticeable decrease in consumption, and each stall is not very busy. Some stall owners expressed that they used to be busy to the point of exhaustion, but now they always find themselves sitting and resting with little business. In Zhengzhou, the salary is not high, but the cost of living is. After deducting rent and daily expenses from their monthly salary, many people have almost no savings left. Nowadays, making money is becoming increasingly difficult and everyone is tightening their belt. Moreover, following the pandemic, housing prices across different regions of China have experienced a three-year consecutive decline, causing concern and alarm. Whether rich or poor, many saw a significant shrinkage of their assets. Many people worry about their mortgage payments and feel suffocated by the pressure. They have to work hard to deal with the repayment problem. Currently, with the economy in a downturn, there are widespread large-scale salary cuts and layoffs across all industries. Behind every employee is a family, and this situation has seriously affected their financials, making their situation even worse. Many families are facing difficulties in making ends meet, especially in cities below the third or fourth tier, where physical stores are struggling with poor performance. Some physical stores are even unable to pay their employees' salaries, and some have to close down. In some places, there are entire streets being closed, which was unimaginable in the past. Something even scarier than falling house prices has emerged. 1.4 1.4 billion people are cutting back on their spending, making it almost impossible to stimulate consumption. This situation is evident in cities across the country. It seems that people are now very alert and cautious, holding on to their money tightly and not daring to spend it casually. 
On the other hand, many people worry that the market value of their houses will fall below the amount of their loans. This is a serious problem for homeowners because if they want to sell their houses to repay their loans, they may lose their assets or need additional money to make up the difference. Currently, the decline in house prices in many cities is still around 30%. However, once the decline exceeds 30%, it will mean that most home buyers' down payments are basically lost. At that time, the houses in the hands of home buyers will be like paying expensive rent every month for 20 to 30 years. During this period, it is necessary to ensure that the houses appreciate in value, otherwise the losses for home buyers will be even greater. Many people are now afraid that they will eventually exchange their lifelong savings for a worthless house. In this situation, many people might consider giving up on repaying their mortgages. Then, a new wave of mortgage defaults will emerge and might happen at a large scale. Next, the banks may step in and take away people's houses. The final result will be that most of the houses in the city belong to the banks, but the houses are empty. The people will end up on a blacklist because they have not fully repaid their mortgages, so they will have to rent separately. There is concern that this dire prediction will soon become a reality. Since the beginning of this year, provincial-level administrations, such as those in Inner Mongolia, Henan, and Beijing, have issued specific measures for tightening belts. Many analysts believe that this is quite an ominous sign. On March 28th, the Ministry of Finance issued a notice on its website, urging all regions and departments to continue tightening their spending. It emphasized the need to strictly manage the free public funds, which refer to overseas visits, official vehicles, and receptions and conferences funds. They also call for controlling expenses, increasing budget constraints and supervision, enhancing budget performance management, and enforcing financial discipline. Other regions have also followed suit. Henan province proposed 10 specific measures, including reducing office building maintenance expenses and updating the requirements for vehicle uses. The Beijing Municipal Administration of Government Logistics has issued 19 specific measures. They propose making full use of the surplus central assets to supplement deficiencies and increasing the amount of assets stored and redistributed. The Bureau of Office Affairs in the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region has released guidelines focusing on repairing and reusing older items, emphasizing the prioritization of currently available office equipment from the centralized warehouse. Guangdong also issued a notice promoting frugality and opposing waste, urging departments to institutionalize these measures. For instance, no longer provide bottled water in regular meetings and participants must bring their own cups. In response, Li Yuanhua, a former professor at Capital Normal University, pointed out in an interview with the Epoch Times that the bureaucratic system of the CCP government requires substantial financial support to operate. Coupled with its various extravagances, the actual expenses that can be saved are extremely limited. The government is indeed facing financial difficulties because most of its original sources of income have dried up. It is worth noting that the CCP government mainly relied on selling land to obtain fiscal revenue in the past. However, now that the real estate market is basically at the brink of collapse, the main source of income has been lost. Due to the operational difficulties of private companies, state-owned enterprises, and foreign-funded companies, tax revenues cannot be collected as scheduled. Some local governments have even had to sell local tourist attractions and assets to fill the fiscal gap. Li Yuanhua said that even the central government is facing a shortage of funds. Former Premier Li Keqiang emphasized the importance of self-reliance at a conference in 2022, stating that the central government does not have enough emergency assistance funds. Although the government is indeed facing financial pressure now, its efforts in saving might be somewhat deceptive. What really needs addressing are the systemic high expenditures, and irrelevant cost-cutting measures cannot solve the fundamental issue. Liu Xiaochuan, former deputy director of the forestry department of Junshan District, Yueyang City in Henan Province, believes that local governments will not wholeheartedly cut costs like the central government. The CCP regime relies on the support of the bureaucratic class. 
If officials are made too miserable or truly experience hardships, they may withdraw completely, no longer serving this regime or upholding it. This prospect is extremely terrifying for the Chinese Communist Party, so it can only continue to incite its officials, shouting slogans such as, quote, officials cannot be poor even if the people are, and sometimes put up a show for them. But it will not be truly implemented, just like the CCP's anti-corruption efforts, which are only selectively carried out to eliminate political dissidents. In efforts to combat corruption and regulate the use of free types of public funds, food and entertainment, travel and vehicles, the CCP has introduced more than a hundred regulations aimed at curbing lavish expenditures, with the rules becoming progressively more specific. However, such practices persist despite the bans. Some officials evade scrutiny by hiding and secretly eating in internal canteens, private clubs, remote rural retreats, and resort to tactics like pouring expensive liquor into mineral water bottles to hide lavish spending. Public funded travel is self-explanatory. It is the use of public funds to pay for the travel expenses of oneself or officials within the bureaucracy. Public vehicles refer to vehicles exclusively for leaders. The power of officials to use vehicles is equivalent to sitting in sedan chairs in feudal society. Once they become officials, they must have a dedicated car as it is regarded as a welfare. In recent years, although there have been multiple reforms of vehicle regulations, the fundamental problem has not changed. Why is this the case? Due to the necessity of attracting members of the bureaucratic classes, official vehicles represent a crucial perk that the CCP considers untouchable. In the past, when management was lax, officials competed against each other. They purchased SUVs with better safety features. Some departments needed dozens of vehicles and some even established fleets or support departments. Later, Xi Jinping stipulated that officials of a certain rank could only ride a certain brand of car, such as Toyota Crown cars for officials at the department level. These vehicle models had a low-key appearance but luxurious interior and configuration, resulting in a huge expense. Subsequently, a policy of monetizing this benefit emerged. Departments auctioned off official vehicles to people with connections and then rented them out to government leaders. The car allowance was issued together with the salary, but the rental fees were still paid by the public funds. The expenses for official vehicles have now become items that are not clearly recorded in financial accounts and are only categorized under various project funds. Additionally, maintaining official buildings is also a huge expense. Some officials find various ways to carry out projects, all of which entail expenditures. The office is used initially as per normal, but they would complain about leaks here and the need for repairs there. So in the end, an item that costs 10,000 yuan is purchased at 30,000 yuan using public funds. In the view of experts, the serious problems of eating and drinking using public funds highlight the flaws in the public finance system. Not only is there a lack of transparency, but also the supervision for budgetary expenditures by the People's Congress is weak. China lacks a robust control and accountability system. While the central party and government departments continue to advocate for getting used to tightening belts, local fiscal funds are becoming increasingly difficult to manage. Many places are seeing waves of salary reductions. An insider from a government department in Guangdong stated that the year-end bonus has been cancelled, and it's considered well off if you can receive monthly salaries on time. All the subsidies given to companies are in arrears, and the government has no money. As early as during the two sessions in 2020, former Minister of Finance, Liu Kun, said that the central government had already cut non-urgent and non-timely expenditures by more than 50% only guaranteeing necessary expenditures such as salaries. A retired civil servant from Shandong province disclosed that since last year, the personal accounts of employee medical insurance have also been greatly reduced. In February of this year, medical insurance was reformed again. Previously, people could receive subsidies of over 300 or even over 500 yuan per month in their accounts. Now those under 70 years old only receive 100 yuan, and those over 70 receive 125 yuan. Outpatient expenses can be reimbursed, but there is a limit. 
Expenses below 500 yuan per year are not reimbursable and only 65% of the amount exceeding 500 yuan can be reimbursed. Those who understand the CCP know that once the CCP announces that it will start tightening belts, people below will have to prepare to bear greater pressure. In fact, about four years ago, the CCP began advocating for cuts in expenses and now the situation is becoming increasingly grim. Some people said that they used to receive over 20,000 yuan for having only one child to support them when they retired, but now they only receive 100 yuan per month. They say it is because there is no money left. Lower classes have it even worse. Even salaries cannot be paid. So where do people have the motivation to work? Additionally, institutional reforms within the system are underway, leading to a continuous reduction in personnel size. If a position can be filled by civil servants, institutional staff, corporate employees or temporary hires, there is a preference for recruiting the individual with lower costs. Many people believe that if China does not break away from communism, its future will be dark. Xi Jinping's advocacy of common prosperity has resulted in common poverty. If China cannot transition to freedom, democracy and peace, revolution and resistance will sooner or later occur. Why did the Soviet Union collapse? It was due to its deviation from a democratic trajectory. Of the original 41 socialist countries, only three remain. The fate of the CCP is foreseeable. NYU economist Noriel Robini recently issued a warning, stating that China needs to abandon its old economic growth model and shift towards a new one focusing on domestic services and private consumption. Otherwise, Xi Jinping may lead China into stagnation. He pointed out that China is increasingly focused on advanced manufacturing exports such as electric vehicles and solar panels, but escalating geopolitical tensions may lead to protectionism and oversupply. Rubini emphasized that China needs to increase domestic investment demand and service sector's share in GDP. He noted that China's historically low household consumption rate has been a major obstacle to economic growth. To avoid trade wars and oversupply, China needs to enhance retirement benefits, strengthen health care coverage, provide unemployment insurance, and grant permanent urban residency rights to migrant workers. However, Rubini believes that the Chinese leadership seems unwilling to boost confidence in the private sector and households. He attributes this to Xi Jinping and his advisors who support the current growth model. According to BBC reports, China's low retirement age will result in hundreds of millions of people retiring in the next decade, creating significant pension burdens and employment pressures. Among this, China faces challenges from negative population growth and other economic issues.